Hello guys and welcome back to Ahead of the Epi Curve and our series Epidemiology 101 video number 4. Today we will be talking about disease surveillance. Um, I mentioned this in the last video, this would be our next topic. And it's just a quick recap of what went on last last week, or in the last couple of weeks. We talked about agents, the chain of infection, and the epidemiological triad. So if you haven't watched that video or you need a little bit of a refresher, please go back and watch that video. And without further ado, we'll get into probably my favorite part of epidemiology, surveillance. So what is the definition of surveillance? So this is another stock definition with multiple components, just like the definition of epidemiology that you're going to want to know. And so it's composed of two different parts. So the first part of this is the systematic ongoing collection, analysis, interpretation, and dissemination. That part, that's what you're doing. And we'll see that in the, in the steps of surveillance or the public health approach in the next slide. And then the second part of health-related data linked to public health practice. So to combine to those, those two things, you get public health surveillance in the whole definition. And then we can see here the surveillance process, which I was talking about earlier. And you can see in the five steps, they're very closely related to the things that appear in the definition. You have data collection, data analysis, data interpretation, data dissemination, and the link to action. And you can see here, collection, analysis, interpretation, dissemination, and the link to action is kind of the second part. The link to public health practice is that second part of the link to action, what you do with that data. So we're going to talk about the each individual step right now. Um, the first step is data collection. And this is just, as it sounds, how you're collecting information about levels of disease, risk factors, anything like that. And there are four main ways or categories of how you do data collection. These are your general surveillance types. And there are more than this, like medical surveillance is not listed here, but these are the four main public health surveillance types. And so the first type is passive surveillance. So data is sent to the health agency without prompting. Um, this is probably the easiest for a health agency to conduct and doesn't require that much manpower. Um, reports are just sent directly to them. And then a good example of this is the National Notifiable Disease Network, um, where hospitals will just, if they get a case of a certain disease, will automatically report it to the CDC. The opposite of that is active surveillance, where the health agency is soliciting reports. So they're sending agents to these hospitals to collect reports. They're sending people to, certain, to clinics, stuff like that, and they're actively going and getting the data. The, these clinics are not, there's no processes where the clinics automatically send it to them. They're having to go into the field to get this, to get this data. And so as you would expect, that's a lot expensive. It takes more time, but it does have its benefits as well in that it can, you, it's easier for the, for the place, for the agency to manage for targeting certain areas. So there are benefits to it. Third up is sentinel surveillance. This is case reporting by a group of pre-selected sources, such as certain clinics or hospitals. If I wanted to figure out the occurrence of lead poisoning in Flint, as we all know, the Flint water crisis is just a couple years removed, why would I include hospitals over the whole state of Michigan? I would just, I would want to target just Flint, or maybe I want to target specific neighborhoods in Flint to get to talk to see differences in things like demographics, race, age. You can stratify, and this helps collect data to compare certain things and allow for comparison and data between two different groups. And the fourth and most, and the type of surveillance that will be, that'll provide the most broad results is syndromic surveillance. And this is surveillance based off of symptoms rather than positive lab tests. And this is especially used for the early detection of an outbreak. So for certain diseases, certain symptoms that are heavily associated with diseases, this could be useful. Maybe for like coplex spots, once you have coplex spots, the chance of you having measles is extremely, extremely high. Um, it can also be used for things like flu or respiratory virus infections that if you have certain set of symptoms, you could say, okay, we're probably going to be entering into an outbreak of respiratory viruses. 
So some examples of surveillance systems, uh, the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System, like I talked about earlier, um, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, which is a phone, essentially just repeated phone surveys for health risk behaviors, chronic diseases, and the access of healthcare. PulseNet, which is basically this massive database for linking cases of foodborne illnesses about the DNA, the pathogens to match sources of foodborne pathogens and help solve outbreaks. And the consistent HIV prevalence and household surveys for HIV patients. So next thing we're going to talk about is the case definition. And this goes, this does go hand in hand with surveillance in that it's how you define what a case is in different levels of the likelihood to be a case. So the true definition of a case definition is a set of uniform criteria used to define a case or of a disease for public health surveillance. And so an example we could do for measles, and I'll, there's a link here, a link to the measles case definition from the CDC, which we can take a quick look at. Here we go. This is what a case definition could look like for measles. If you want to take a look at it, I'll put the link to that in the description. But yeah, case definition. So to case definition, to be a good case definition, must include person, place, time, and clinical criteria. And it can often be defined as confirmed, probable, or possible, depending on the presence of a lab test and number of symptoms present. So this is another way to have, a, this is another case definition for measles. You can see how it's stratified by itself. Confirmed, probable, and then another, just some general clinical description. What you can see from the confirmed is that for it to be confirmed, it has, it has the isolation of a measles virus from the clinical specimen. All of these have, all of these say, some sort of lab test. So in order to be confirmed, you need a lab test. What's the difference? Confirmed case meets clinical criteria for disease and has lab confirmed positive test. Probable meets most or all symptom slash criteria, but is lacking a test result, lab test or test depending result. Possible is some but lacks a positive lab test. And not a case for an outbreak could be out of the time period, no symptoms, no lab test, negative lab tests. That would be that. Now, case report. Um, a lot of times people get case reports and case definitions mixed up because they sound so similar. But a case definition is broader. Like you, you apply a definition of something to many different things. A case report is for one single person. You're reporting information about one single person. So this is a, on the right here, is an image of a case report form for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Um, and it'll include things like demographic information, name, address, location, um, risk factors, race, um, clinical, just clinical information like symptoms, possible exposures. Like um, if, for example, the bubonic plague one will have, could have exposure to animals and will also for symptoms will have um, disease specific symptoms like buboes, presence of buboes, where are they, stuff like that. So the natural history of disease, and this is just how disease progresses, and obviously disease occurs differently in every single person. I can get a disease and I'll be fine in a week. Someone else might get a disease and they take multiple weeks, a month, maybe they even could die from it. But in general, disease follows a certain general step past. You have a stage of susceptibility where you are at risk of getting a disease and then you have an exposure. At an exposure point, whatever the pathogen is, whether it be a virus, bacteria, or anything like that, enters your body, and then you enter into the stage of subclinical disease. At sometime during the stage of subclinical disease, which is where you're not experiencing symptoms, but the pathogens within your body, pathological changes, so within your cells, start to happen. So maybe the virus is starting to get into some of your cells and is lysing some of your cells. The stage of subclinical disease ends in the stage of clinical disease begins when you have the onset of symptoms and normally your time of diagnosis is soon after because you're not going to the doctor to test for something for most things unless you have symptoms. Obviously there are there are exceptions to every rule like sometimes you go for pre-screening for breast cancer or other diseases 
but most of the time you go see a doctor to get tested for something after you've shown symptoms. So once that time of diagnosis, you progress through your stage of clinical disease, and once that's over, you're either recovered, you have some sort of lasting disability, but the disease is gone, or you have passed away. And that will do it for today. I hope you enjoy learning about surveillance and a couple other a couple other random topics thrown in here, natural history of disease, case reports, case definitions, but they're all very important in the collection of data and then the ability to apply it to our investigations. Um, again, hope you enjoyed and see you next week for the next video.